Welcome to Recovery Stories from the Pandemic. And we have a special guest with us today, Kelly, who has been brave enough um, to share her story actually for the very first time. So Kelly, thank you so much for joining us on Recovery Stories from the Pandemic. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So, you know, the reason why we really wanted to share your story, Kelly, we wanted to give people hope in the midst of this pandemic. A lot of people are struggling and wondering, should I go to treatment now? Um, What is it going to be like? And we figured that people could have learned a lot from your journey. So first, take me back to when did you start realizing that you were struggling with alcohol? So it took me a while. Um, I had people start saying, making comments to me about how much I was drinking, um, and how often, and then that brought me into the period where I would just lie about it. Um, I felt like if people were going to judge me, then they just didn't need to know. Um, I was going out a lot, um, and then I would drink before I'd go out and I didn't actually even realize that it had gotten as bad as it had until I literally, I I was going into panic attacks. Um, And that's when it finally all came out that I was struggling. Mm -hmm. And so when you were dealing with the panic attacks and realizing you were struggling, how did the pandemic play a role in all of that? So The pandemic led to working from home um, and then days where schools and daycares and stuff would close due to the pandemic, I'd be working from home and having my children at home. And I didn't have the adult interaction that I normally get on a day-to-day basis. So I just felt secluded and isolated and felt like I had no one to turn to or nowhere to go other than my house. Mm-hmm. And so was it during this time of the pandemic, I know you said feeling that isolation, did it cause you to drink more? Did you find that it was making matters even more difficult for you in terms of controlling how often you were drinking? Yeah. So being at home, I had, I mean, you have unlimited access to whatever you have in your house. So there wasn't where, I mean, I had all day. Like, granted, I was working and all of that, but it's right there. So it was just unlimited access to it. And once again, the isolation and seclusion, no one's there to talk to. No one's there to, I mean, I'm an adult, so ultimately no one could tell me anyway, but no one's there to help you get through that. So drinking just became more and more frequent. Mm -hmm. How often or how much would you say you were drinking? Um, It was an everyday thing. And I would drink during the day. If I didn't drink during the day, I would start to shake. Um, And then I would just continue until basically I would pass out at night. Wow. So every day you were finding that you were getting to the point that you were drinking every day. And were you passing out? Would you find on most days or... I felt like that was the only way that I could fall asleep. Mm -hmm. And so what led you in the midst of the pandemic to finally get help? What was it? What shifted? Because I know you said you were, you know, you've been struggling with this for some time and you were starting to hide it from people. But what made you make that choice at that time? So I had some really mean comments made to me from my family. Um, They wanted me to just, you know, it was a just stop situation. And um, they said, if I couldn't do it for myself, then do it for my kids. And even though I wanted to stop and I wanted to stop for my kids, I couldn't. I couldn't get myself to just stop. Um, So I had gotten to the point where... I had drank a lot. I was home by myself with my daughter and my mom had stopped over to check on me. And I mean, I was out of it. So she took me to the emergency room and 
they admitted me for detox. Mm -hmm. And I can understand having to deal with that, you know, admitting you for detox, your mom comes over. And I want to go back and touch on something that you said that I think it's so powerful is a lot of people don't realize that addiction is a disease. And even though you wanted to be there for your daughter, like people were like, just do it for your daughter, help others to understand why that is so challenging when you're dealing with an alcohol addiction, even though you really want it to. So actually I have, I have two kids and they're my world. Like, I, I mean, I would die for them. I would do anything for them. Um, there was just something there that I just, I, I couldn't stop. Um, I tried and it was, I mean, alcohol became my go-to. So if I was happy, you know, well, why not celebrate? If I was sad, that makes me feel better. Um, same with depression, isolation, like, it just was my go-to and I couldn't function without it. So no matter how much I wanted to stop for them, because I would do anything for them, I couldn't. Mm -hmm. And that's hard. No, and I, I can only imagine to be in that position. What do you, how do you grapple in that position? What is it like knowing that you want to, but knowing also that this, you know, that the alcohol addiction had started to take over what is that like to live like that on a daily basis? So I kind of, it kind of made me feel like I was a bad parent. Um, I see all these other people who can go out and just have one drink and be just fine, but I couldn't do that. Um, and then, you know, just, it, it just put me in even more of a spiral down because everyone made it seem so easy. Like they're like, just, just don't drink, just, just stop. And it wasn't that simple for me. I couldn't just stop. I couldn't put the drink down. I couldn't, I just couldn't. So ultimately it just made me feel like a terrible parent. Mm -hmm. And how long had you been struggling with the addiction? When you look back, I know you said you started to hide it, but how long had you been feeling like this? So I had drank teenage years and stuff like that, but it got a lot worse once the pandemic hit because I was isolated. I didn't have that interaction with anybody. So it got a lot worse once I started working from home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, one, first I want to commend you for finally um, going to treatment. I know you said you end up in the hospital. They're detoxing you, um, dealing with that. What made you in that moment say, now is the time I need to go and get help? And what did you do? So once I was in the hospital for detox, um, I don't, obviously, I don't remember the first day or so. Um, but I had gotten a phone call from American Addiction Centers and, you know, they kind of went over everything with me and I felt like it was the right time because my kids are so little and I'm hoping they don't remember any of that necessarily. So, and I also wanted to do, get myself better. I wanted to keep my job. I wanted to keep my family. So I felt like if I got it, went and gotten treatment now, I could hopefully get it all under control. Mm -hmm. And making that first decision, was it easy or did you still struggle with it? I'm curious because I feel like, you know, in the midst of this pandemic, there are a lot of people who are at that point. They maybe call into a place like American Addiction Centers or they try to get help or they're in that process. What was that part like? So it was still a hard decision. Um, the place that was available was Recovery First in Fort Lauderdale. It's a very far away, it's far away from home. I'd have to leave my kids. I'd never left them for like that before. Um, I'd have to leave my job. Um, so it was still a very hard decision to make. Um, but I was able to speak with my job and they approved FMLA. I got my husband and family on board. They, they wanted me to do it. So the help and support that I finally did get to go, 
helped me, helped push me to do it. Mm -hmm. So having that support system around you was critical. And when you look back, do you, what do you think would have happened had you not gone at that point? I don't think I would still have my family. <laughs> like that was a threat that was made before treatment and um, a comment that was made after treatment when I relapsed. Mm -hmm. Wow. So that was something that was you were dealing with. And you mentioned you went away to treatment. And I think you bring up a good point that you did have a point where you relapsed. But first, let's go when you went to treatment. What was that like? Because I think there are a lot of perceptions of what treatment is. But what was that like for you? So tr arriving at treatment, um, it's very nerve wracking. I was very anxious. Um, I'm not a very outgoing person, so I felt isolated there when I got there at first as well. Um, but I will say that people who are in a recovery center or who have been through recovery or who are going through recovery are very supportive. Um, people introduced themselves and made me feel welcome and made me feel like I was able to talk. They don't judge you. And a lot of them actually relate more than you think. So initially arriving, like I said, was very nerve wracking. Um, but once you're there, you definitely, I was definitely welcomed and it made me feel more able to speak and talk and um, re relate to everybody. Mm -hmm. And how did, would you say treatment impacted you? Did you go for, how long were you there for? And how would, what would you say was the impact on you? So I was there for almost 30 days. Um, and it definitely opened my eyes to realize, you know, this is a disease. This isn't just something that you can choose to turn on and off when you want to. Um, I've learned the tools and stuff to learn to talk. Um, I still struggle with that, but. I am able to, and I'm able to um, recognize what I'm feeling and like when I want to drink to have options to not do that. Um, so it's, it's definitely been something that opened my eyes to all the feelings that I do have and to try not to suppress them. And what did it feel like to not be drinking, to not have alcohol in your system for the first time since maybe you're, like you said, since you were younger? So when I first arrived there, I, I had to go and you do detox. Um, it was terrible. I felt horrible. I was very shaky. I had headaches. I was very anxious. Um, but they do they do help you through that. Um, they do have stuff that, you know, helps you to try to work through that. But ultimately, the first few days was terrible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, a lot of people don't realize that alcohol is actually one of the most dangerous drugs to detox from. And so it is so important, Kelly, you know, that you were in a place, like you said, I can only imagine if you had tried to do that on your own or had been at home, but to, you know, be in an environment where you could have the support and the, the comfort treatment to make sure that you were okay through that process. But once you got through detox and the alcohol was kind of out of your system, how did you feel? Did you feel different? Yes. Um... I don't really know how to describe the feeling. Um, it was different um, to actually have to feel what you're feeling. Normally, I would just drink to numb all of that. So to feel what happy feels like, to feel what sad feels like, to feel all of that was weird um, and very hard for me because I, I, always, I would always say I don't do feelings. Um, so having to sit there and deal with what you're feeling was probably the hardest thing, but you also, I also got to 
enjoy the feelings finally. I got to enjoy the things around me. I got to enjoy conversations with people. Um, I was able to actually listen and focus on what were be what was being said in groups. Um, so it definitely changed all of that. I was able to focus, talk, listen, feel. So that's that's how I feel after mm-hmm. stopping. Wow. So what kind of was like a reconnection to yourself? Wow. I can imagine that could have been very, a very big deal for you to feel those feelings again. And so you leave treatment, you go back home. And I think this is something a lot of people don't realize is that um, addiction is like diabetes. It's a chronic disease that you have to live with all your life. And sometimes there may be times where you can relapse. And so I know you mentioned that um, as part of your story. So tell me what happened? Because I know you said you had the tools and you were starting to do okay. Um, what led you to, do you find, to relapse and have to um, deal with this again or to find a, a, your place back to to treatment or help? So I'd gotten back home and, um, you know, you don't get to ease back into anything. So you're coming back from treatment and I mean, I jump right back in. So I have work, I have the kids again. I, I'm i dealing with all of that. Um, at that point, my husband was not being very supportive. Um, it was, we didn't talk. We didn't talk about me being in treatment. We didn't, we didn't talk about any of that. It was kind of like it never existed. So that didn't really help me. Um, I just felt shut down again. Like I couldn't talk about my feelings. There was no point. Um, so I got overwhelmed with the kids and just everyday life and work. And I, I started feeling like a terrible mother again, a terrible wife. I couldn't keep up. So I ultimately just turned back to what I knew best. What would you say to other family members who have a loved one who goes away to treatment and comes back, particularly during this pandemic when, you know, we're dealing with stress and isolation and all those things are still there. What do you wish you had or what do you wish was needed that families need to know about? So I think that families, friends um, need to keep in mind that just because for me, example, like just because I went to treatment doesn't mean I'm cured. Like there's not really a cure for any of this. Um, pretending that it doesn't exist doesn't help. I mean, that just for me made me feel so secu- secluded again. Um, I couldn't talk about it because nobody acknowledged it. Mm. Um, I'd feel stressed, overwhelmed. Well, what do I do if no one understands where I'm going, what, what I'm, where I'm coming from, or what I'm trying to express with that. Um, so keeping in mind that it's it's not cured. Like I have to fight this every day. Hmm. No, I think that's so powerful what you said, Kelly, because I think a lot of people don't realize that as we were saying that this is a chronic disease. And as you said, you have to fight this every day. It's something that you think about or have to deal with, you know, often or every day, like you said. So, you know, you said you went to the point where you got back and you relapsed. So what did you do at that point when you found yourself kind of turning back to that coping mechanism for you? So once I relapsed, um, once again, I had some mean things said to me. Um, My husband would take the kids and I'd be on my own, basically. Um, so that to me was eye opening, um, especially when I'm just, I need support. So I ended up getting a therapist and trying to work through it that way. Um, I did end up in a PHP program. So that helped with having such support there. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's so important. And just to, for people may not understand, um, PHP stands for partial hospitalization. So you're still getting that support as you kind of transition back into um, the community and your life and just having that therapist there. So tell me, where are you now, Kelly? How are you feeling today? I am doing so much better. 
Um, I have over nine months sober now. I'm working. I have, you know, I still have the same stressors and all of that. Um, but I don't, I try not to let myself get to the point of where I feel like I don't have an option to turn other than to drinking. So whether that be just texting a friend randomly, um, doing something with my kids, doing, talking to my husband about random stuff. Um, I do go to an alumni group on Thursdays from recovery first. Um, so I do have that also. So I'm, I mean, it's good and I'm really happy to be doing it sober. Wow. That is amazing. First of all, congratulations, Kelly, on nine months. That is a big deal. And, you know, you got back up even after your relapse and went and sought help again. And now you're connected to a support group through Recovery First, which has been great. And to see that you are at the place that you are now is, you know, is definitely a blessing. So if there were, you know, just a few final thoughts from you, Kelly, if there were someone who is hearing your story, I know we are, you know, this is um, playing during Recovery Month or being aired during Recovery Month. What would you say to that person if you could talk to someone who is just like you were at that moment, sitting there struggling, a mom, what would you say to them? Um, I would say to reach out for help. Don't let yourself continue to struggle. Uh, feelings of being a bad parent and all of that, it's, it's the addiction. Um, you know, try to get help before it gets even worse. Um, like I said, now I couldn't, I, I don't ever want to go back. I do fight it every day. Um, and that is a thing. I mean, it's going to be a struggle, but it is worth it. Mm -hmm. I love it. So it is worth it. And my final question for you, Kelly, is you said it's worth it. What has been the best part of recovery? The best part of recovery for me has been getting back to the mom that I know that I could be and the wife that I could be and the daughter that I could be and the friend that I could be. Wow, such a powerful story. So Kelly, thank you so much for telling your story to us. Um, it takes a lot of bravery to share what you've gone through, but I know your story will touch lives.